the CEO of REAP. So we have a great group here with us. And ladies and gentlemen, we really want to highlight the word nexus. Nexus, nexus, nexus. And what's terrific at this year's COP, COP27, going around the various pavilions, we are seeing more and more connectedness or joined upness across those pavilions because we know how important it is during these complex times to focus on nexus approaches. Many countries, governments are trying to shelter consumers from higher energy prices, reduce dependency on fossil fuels, and adapt to the climate crisis. In low income and lower middle income countries, climate adaptation investment falls woefully short, still woefully short, and rarely materializes effective adaptation on the ground. Despite the climate crisis, and despite the climate change urgency and high level commitments at COP26, climate finance for agri SMEs is still yet to really emerge, certainly at the volume and scale and speed that is necessary. Only approximately 4% or around US dollars 700 million went to value chain actors in non-OECD countries. So there's a lot more to do. Localized energy and food nexus approaches increase the effectiveness and improve food security, closing the gap between NDCs, pledges, and impact. And we know for sure that policies are needed to accelerate this transition, including to reduce food losses improve management of resource intensive inputs such as fertilizer, so optimization being a key word there, and supply more clean energy for food production, irrigation, processing, cooling, transport, preparation, and distribution. So lots to do, and I'm looking forward to a ter terrific discussion uh, around that. But I'm absolutely delighted to welcome the Honorable Minister Ruth Nankabirawa, Sintamanu, the Minister of Energy and Mineral Development from Uganda. And in many ways, if, I'm, if I may be so bold, Minister, you embody the nexus. And I'll explain what I mean by just talking a little bit briefly to your, your bio. So you're the Minister of Energy and Mineral Development for the Republic of Uganda, this position you've held since June 2021. And before that, Dr. Sentama, uh, Sentamu excuse me, was the government chief whip and previously served as Minister of State in the Ministries of Agriculture, Finance, Defense, and the Office of the Prime Minister. So a rich and varied portfolio, which no doubt equips you expertly to speak to areas around the nexus, which is why we're so delighted to, and honored to have you with us. So, Minister, over to you, please, for your key remarks. Uh, thank you very much, distinguished panelists, the organizers. Good afternoon to you. I'm delighted to be here on behalf of my team from Uganda, and I want to welcome you to Uganda, the power of Africa. I am happy to participate in COP27 because I think this is the time that God chose for Africa to unite and have a voice that will save the climate. And I hope this time round, we will be able to come out with actionable points we will be able to come out with a consensus that finance is very key in whatever journey that we are moving. Africa is, uh, Uganda is uh, an agricultural country, and agriculture is our backbone. 
agriculture employs over 80 percent of the people. We've been bragging about our fertile soils and the sunshine, but now we are facing the effects of climate change. So we no longer brag about fertile soils because when El Nino comes, the soils are washed away. The fertile soils are washed away. When La Nino comes, then we cannot plant because we, we've been basing ourselves on the natural rainfall and we have those two seasons in a year, planting season is in a year, which you have been bragging about. But things are changing. We also have to change. I want to thank everybody who has been working with us in Uganda in as far as utilization of technologies to bridge the gaps in agriculture, in the mineral sector, and in the fisheries sector, because that's the way. Uganda has come up with uh, many policies which are guiding us. We are targeting water harvest through the parish development model. We are encouraging every homestead to make sure that they have a water harvest facility which they can use to at least do mini irrigations at home. Drip irrigation so that you will not lack vegetables, you will not lack the basic foods in a home before you, th you talk about growing for export. You have to target food security in the homes. So water harvest is very key. It is doing wonders, demonstrated by the president himself, where you see him fetching water on a bicycle, you know, Im imitating uh, the local person, the very local person on the ground, and using empty water bottles. You pierce at the bottom, and you place the water bottle with water at the plant and you will be doing uh, drip irrigation. But we are also moving ahead to use the solar panels to do mini irrigations using solar powered pumps. And this is on basically a larger scale. That is yielding results. That means we will not wait for the rainfalls to come in order for us to grow our food. From there, we are also trying to use our mineral resources to add value to the mineral resources, to create fertilizers, because with irrigation alone, you cannot improve productivity. You need the fertilizers. The African soils have aged throughout, again because of climate change. Climate change has affected the soils themselves. So we need fertilizers. So the mineral subsector is there to work on value addition from the phosphates to make sure that we have the fertilizers to help on agriculture. We, in the same way, encourage value addition in the agriculture, we encourage uh, post-harvest handling. We have to provide the cooling systems. I come from uh, both agriculture but a uh, cattle keeping area where we need the mini coolers which are supported by a solar, uh, a solar panel to provide for energy to cool the milk. We've gone ahead to work with um, our renewable energy uh, department to see how to layers with the Diary Development Authority of Uganda to use the, the droppings from our animals, the cow dung from the, the cows, from the pigs, from the from the gods to do biomass, bio biogas. We have identified collecting centers 
for biogas, but from the biogas, apart from using the methane, we will use the silage as fertilizers. We want to change the, the mode of transport. We want to use biogas for mobility. A person who ferries a truck of cow dung uses fuel. We, uh, from this project, we want to change to using gas instead of using uh, petroleum or, or diesel in the trucks themselves. That will be an incentive for somebody who brings the cow dung to get the tins comprised of gas which can be utilized. So we're trying to uh, interlink from the mineral sector to support agricultural value addition to the petroleum upstream developments where we are going to have a refinery which is going to refine 60,000 barrels of crude oil a day and 170,000 will go through the East African crude oil pipeline which has been talked about all over the world. And then the refinery will help us, first of all, reduce on the carbon that is emitted through the number of trucks that bring in petroleum products because we are a net importer. So by the refinery, we shall reduce the emission, but also we will get fertilizers again from the refinery. So the fertilizers, again, will help us on the agriculture side. So it is an interlinked um, association which has to target, same target of increased production and productivity, increased value addition, which will see us handle hunger, but also people will be able to get money which money is needed to be able to use electricity. Because in Uganda, the tariff is very high. Because again, we put in money which has high interest rate. So the end user tariff has to be affordable. The source of energy has to be green, uh, clean energy, but it has to be reliable and it has to be sustainable. So that is what we have. Agriculture, uh, minerals, uh, petroleum, they can be utilized. There is technology that can combine all those sectors to work together. And that is our policy. We have policies in place. We do not allow exportation of unprocessed minerals. We want to use iron ore, again, to help even in agriculture setting, because we have a lot to construct in agriculture. On the fisheries, let me also mention that we, using the mini grids, solar mini grids on the islands, we have about 83 habitable islands in Uganda. The fisher, fishing community, wants two things. One, the ice plant, where they will be able to get ice for their fish. Secondly, the drying facility. You can use solar to create the drying facility. Basically, these are the two things that the fishing community want in order for them to do good fishing. This is what I can give you for now, but I want to end by thanking you for the support that you are giving us and pledge that Uganda is open. Uganda works with the private sector. We are a private sector-led economy in Uganda. We have incentives. We provide land for strategic industries. And so it is the place to come because we have those good incentives. The political will is there. And I call upon everyone to really come in and enjoy the Pearl of Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. And 
we wholly endorse the African biogas component program and that embodiment of a nexus approach right there and the value that it is indeed having in Uganda and, and beyond. If I may, Minister, come back to you with one additional question. I think we'd, do you have any examples of strong public-private partnerships that you've seen are already working well and offer pathways to scale in Uganda or potentially to be replicated elsewhere? Public-private partnerships. Yes, of course. Like I told you, we first enacted the law on PPP. In power generation, we have the public-private partnership. We have a dam which we are almost completing, where we contributed money with uh, the Chinese uh, uh, government company. And uh, it's going to give us, I think, the cheapest power. This is the Karuma Dam. It's going to give us the cheapest power, generating 600 megawatts. Then uh, Isimba Dam, generating 185 megawatts. We again worked, we contributed money, and we worked together with the uh, uh, Chinese company. I can't be able to enumerate many more, but uh, even on the irrigation, I think we have one big irrigation scheme in eastern Uganda where we are operating with uh, a PPP. In Kasese, we have one, also a big irrigation scheme serving the people of Uganda. But when government has contributed money and then the private uh, sector contributed money. Thank you very much, Minister. And you highlighted in your earlier remarks on the, on the power side the importance of affordability, reliability, and sustainability. So thank you very much for that. Before we start to get into our panel presentations and discussion, we do just want to share a three-minute video on the Energy for Development program and really highlighting sustainable energy for agriculture and some of the initiatives underway there. So if we, if we could roll that video, please. The sun, one of nature's gifts to Africa, is abundant. In Kenya, beyond the main electricity grid, the sun is fusing with technology to power smallholder businesses and agriculture. Solar power uh, technologies plays a critical role in economic uh, development in Kenya, especially in the agricultural sector and also in the small businesses in Kenya, uh, specifically in the off-grid areas. Productive use appliances have a big potential to transform rural economies and especially underserved and off-grid rural economies. Look at avocado farmers in Moranga County. They grow the famed Haas avocado for export. For a long time, they grappled with post-harvest losses due to lack of cold storage. Middlemen took advantage of them. Today, a solar technology has come to their rescue. Soko Fresh has introduced this solar-powered cold storage here. Farmers are now able to keep the produce fresh. They can preserve their harvest and earn more because of reduced post-harvest loss. Barafu ina to saidia sana kwa sababu ya hii avocado haiiribiki. We harvest from the farmers, bring the produce to the cold storage, we charge 2 shillings a kilo. Soko Fresh serves about 600 smallholder avocado farmers in Moranga County. Through this model, we are seeing farmer incomes increase by 20 to 30%. Soko Fresh moves the cold storage from region to region. And solar technology is more than cooling. The future of the smallholder farmers is dependent on solar technology. In Matungulu constituency, Machakos County, Mwangi Njomo does what he knows best, tending to his farm. All this is under solar irrigation system. This area is a semi-arid area and the only way to do farming is through irrigation. 
Jomo's pump was purchased from Sun Culture through the PayGo model, a prepaid credit concept for solar technology. And now the results are clear. This sweet potato, it is a product of irrigation. Today, Jomo can happily feed his family and sell the surplus. This panel we work here. Uh, Solar technology is also hatching profitable poultry ventures. In Narok County, Daniel Karyanke and his wife Abigail Morombi turned to solar to boost their small poultry business. The couple is installing a portable solar egg incubator. Vincent Mervin is an officer at Mwezi Solar. We are targeting women mostly who are in the off-grid areas. They are mostly engaged with the poultry businesses. We want to uh, ensure that we uplift their socio-economic enterprises through this incubator. Small wonder, Mervin is seeing a revolution. This product is going to revolutionize the poultry business in the country. Great, so now we want to turn to our panel discussion, and I know we've got a number of presentations ready, and as much as possible, I know we're also keen to make this panel discussion as interactive as possible. So Nico, if I may, I'm gonna start with you, um, because I know you'd like to tell us about flows of climate adapt adaptation implementation monies, particularly for, for local actors, and how that can improve the agri-energy and nexus programming. So Nico, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Simon, and thank you, Honorable Minister, to, to give us a, a good invitation to come to Uganda. I'm happy to say that we are present in Uganda, also as IKEA Foundation. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming uh, this afternoon, um, among all the, the many sessions that, you, that you're picking us. Uh, to listen. Um, at this, this COP, I think, is the first COP where indeed food systems are on the agenda and where we are indeed talking about also the nexus between energy and, um, and food systems, not just from a mitigation point of view, but especially, crucially, here in Africa, also from an adaptation and resilience point of view. And so far, way too little money, climate money, is going to adaptation. I think globally around 3% and less than 2% even in Africa. So this needs to be stepped up. Uh, and in, in IKEA Foundation, we are both supporting food systems from an agricultural point of view. I'm representing the agriculture team, but also from the renewable energy point of view. And many of our partners are here present uh, in the panel, but also uh, at COP, um, and we believe that philanthropic money, philanthropic investment uh, can be seen as a catalyst to bring new technologies, to develop new technologies that are really based on the needs of off-grid households, of smallholder farmers, of starting small and medium enterprises to make a change in their environment, to make a change in their livelihoods. And we believe that this nexus is really important um, because we cannot boost food systems, we cannot boost agriculture to become more regenerative, circular, and inclusive without paying attention to the energy poverty that we are seeing. And same as in the video, I wanted to highlight uh, three important areas uh, of investment that we are also working on and try to support. And I think the first is to use renewable energy to boost agriculture productivity. We all know that the population is growing rapidly and we need to keep up with food production. By and large, Africa is at the moment a food importing continent and that should not be and shouldn't have to be as it is. So we believe that indeed investments in, for instance, solar-based irrigation can provide a good boost to secure production and productivity uh, to the future. But it is not just about the technology itself. 
I think it's also to take a systems perspective on this, to think about water availability for irrigation. How do we not just use water, but also how do we store and recharge water, water sources? Um, how do we also look at water conservation? How do we also look at, for instance, do farmers have security over land so they want to make the investment in it? And if they want to make the investment, are the right investment tools and models available? Um, we are working in Kenya, for instance, also uh, around pay-as-you-go innovations that farmers don't have to put up the full investment up front but can pay little by little because they often don't have the money uh, that is needed. A second area I think is very important in the food system improvements is the area of, of uh, food loss. Uh, a lot of food is lost between production and consumption. And this is simply unacceptable uh, that it's now still happening. Uh, so we need investments there in, uh, in drying technology, in storage technology, cold storage, like the model from SoCoFresh um, that you saw. But again there, and I think the SoCoFresh model is a beautiful model, really developed around the needs of a smallholder farmer. Many smallholders often don't have enough produce every day to bring to the market. So if they have a solution where they can store their production for three, four days, bring it together as a group, and then be an, an attractive party for a private sector entrepreneur who needs volume, that can really be a breakthrough technology. Um, and the third and the last area I wanted to highlight, I think, is, is the need uh, for renewable energy in circular applications, like uh, how do we manage um, crop residue? How do we manage crop waste? How do we, can, can we use renewable energy technology to process that back into fertilizers, organic fertilizers, or other soil health improvement products. And too little work is done on that at the moment. Uh, there needs to be more research and development to really find alternatives to also, like, to alternatives for fossil-based fertilizers, which we may still be able to use for 10, 20 years, but after that, we will need alternative products. And I think it's now time to really invest a lot of money in good research, in good development of alternatives so that we can maintain future production of food and we need renewable energy technologies for that. Uh, so let me summarize that. You know, the next is, I think, for us is about learning. The next is for us is also about collaborating, but really to make it based on the needs of the users, to take a systems-focused approach on it, and to find the right tools for financing and affordability. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Nico. And you rightly highlight Soco Fresh as a success example. 50% of horticultural produce in Kenya doesn't make it to market because it loses its freshness. 50%. So that's why investments into companies such as Soco Fresh are, are so important. And then on the land tenure issues, the number of countries that I get to go to where I see or I hear the reluctance to make investments into land because of the tenure issues or the risks around those, the, those investments because of lack of land tenure is um, yeah, a huge barrier. But Nico, and I might ask this to other panelists as well um, to see if we can get a bit of discussion going. Where do you see some of the most promising categories of climate smart investment? Where are, where, you know, where are the real promising opportunities there? Um, yeah, I think, I think that depends a bit also on, 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 on the type of crop or the type of value chain we're looking at. I think some of the most promising probably are in the in perishable foods, because that's where the highest return can be made also for smallholder farmers. And it's also in the combination, I think, of that. Uh, if we look at horticulture, they cannot do without being secure of water, but they can also not do without being secure of post-harvest technology. So we need to find, e even that's an axis in itself. Uh, so it's not either or investments, but it's an and investment to really look at the whole system. How is the system functioning? And how can we uplift the whole system without picking out one or two simple uh, uh, initiatives, but really, yeah, from the, from the needs of the user, from the needs of that, that stakeholder environment, 
to support that, to lift up the whole chain at once instead of just lifting up one component of it. Okay, thank you. We might come back to that. Um, Nashilala, let me, let me turn to you, please. You're going to tell us, I hope, about how improved energy access can enhance food security. All right, thank you so much, Simon, for this opportunity for, for WWF uh, to have to share our experiences and trying to influence the nexus between uh, the food system, energy, and for us, water as well. Um, Honorable Minister, thank you also for the opportunity to share with you and understand from a policymaker's perspective the efforts that you're making to try and improve uh, energy access uh, for your people and for our people. I just want to say that when we talk about adaptation, in Africa, the high levels of energy poverty are one of the factors that is going to actually limit the successful adaptation of the continent and of our agriculture system um, in, in particular. We know that there are a lot of numbers that are thrown out there in terms of the extent of energy poverty um, in Africa. Um, and some of the latest numbers that we have uh, were that there was, there was actually an improvement between 2013 and 2018. In 2013, we would, we, it was said that 610 million Africans do not have access to electricity. The number slightly improved in 2018 and went down to 595. However, without robust investments in a mix of energy options, we still have millions of Africans without um, access to, to, to reliable and affordable uh, clean, clean energy. Uh, when it comes to my own country, um, only 30% of, uh, about 34% of the population have access to power. When you talk about access to rural areas, it's even worse, it's only 8%. And I have to spotlight the rural area because that's where mostly the agriculture happens. And so if we're going to shift um, uh, the status of, 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 of our adaptation of our agriculture system, it's critically important that energy policy and agriculture policy and maybe even water policy are actually developed side by side in a very coherent um, manner. Um, nonetheless, I'm also um, happy to say that at, on, on a policy level in Zambia, the government has done a few things, particularly in terms of trying to do systematic energy planning by trying to get to understand not only what, what power needs agriculture has, but also what power needs other sectors uh, do have. So coming to WWF, our various projects around the world have made some efforts in investing in projects that are aimed at strengthening uh, this nexus. We've done this at the community level through our sustainable agriculture programs, but we've also done this uh, working with private sector and working with them to find financing solutions for them to be able uh, to adapt uh, and provide more sustainable and reliable um, energy. So for example, I think some, uh, some of our examples as WA are very similar to what was uh, broadcasted on, the, um, on, on video and also shared by Nico. But just to say that um, from a nexus point of view, the water, agriculture, and energy we work in a community in southwest Zambia with about 6,400 farmers where we are supporting them to adapt uh, to the realities of drought in, in the area. So what traditionally they would have rain for, for about uh, five months, that has drastically uh, reduced. But thanks to the investments that was made to enable uh, solar powered irrigation technologies, these farmers are able to produce food and secure their households and also improve their income on an annual basis. And we believe that um, uh, multiplication or scaling up those sort of solutions, I think would make a difference. And my appeal to our, our, our policymaker is that I think it would be good for an African conversation to happen around that. There are so many isolated NGO investments that are happening that are making a difference, which we feel there could be wider impact if they were part of um, a government uh, a policy making. As the World Wildlife Fund, we work also in wildlife areas. And, and what threatens food security in wildlife areas is when wildlife, because of water scarcity, go in and destroy farms. 
uh, of already vulnerable uh, communities. So, so some of the investments that we've made uh, around um, solar-powered fences that, 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 that prevent wildlife from going into uh, the farms of, 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 of these farmers. I also wanted to share an, an example around um, um, the, role, the important role that um, solar-powered cooling system in Kenya again have, have delivered for the fishing community on the coast. So um, as with the case with Soko Fresh, uh, sometimes the farmers there would lose between 50 and 100 percent of their harvest because they didn't have cold storage uh, facilities. And so thanks to uh, this project by WWF Kenya, which is called Kigali Cooking, a uh, cooling efficiency um, a project, we've been able to strengthen uh, the, the, the management um, capacities of the community level fisheries uh, marine management groups, but beyond that, uh, through that, that organization, they've been able to put in the infrastructure that has enabled the cooling, that has reduced drastically the post-harvest losses. And so it means that not just for the farmers, but for the, for the communities around, they can have a more reliable supply of the protein, which uh, they probably did not have uh, before. So we, we, we have these, these examples at the community level, but of, perhaps at the level of the private sector, which is slightly um, larger than the typical um, you know, community programs, conservation programs that we have. Through the DFCD, we have worked with um, a, a, a company which is some sort of a cooperative of cane growers in the Kafir Flats. And what we try to do as WWF is to try to understand the challenge from a landscape perspective. Understand in a particular landscape, what are the pressure points to biodiversity? And unsustainable energy it has been a very big issue in terms of really driving uh, negative impacts on, on biodiversity. So thanks to the DFCD program that SNB, WWF, and others have come together to help private sector adapt to the reality of reduced water uh, for, for their farming, this company is going to be supported with financing to actually invest in large-scale uh, drip ir irrigation technology. So I think, I think I'll just leave it there uh, for now. I, th I think our central message as, as WWF is that, first of all, uh, there's some s examples of success, success. We cannot scale those up without a, a deliberate policy at the government level for scaling up those solutions, but also to ensure policy coherence between other different critical sectors that affect the delivery um, of, of, of energy. And then secondly, I think what's critically important is the innovation and perhaps which we can speak to um, later in terms of really how are we um, uh, influencing improved access to low carbon and low affordable energy options in the different places we work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nashira. But let, let, let's open up that, that up a little bit then. So there's some fantastic examples there of um, private sector mobilization, funding coming in, enabling adaptation. How do we create stronger incentives to enable adaptation in those places where the private sector flows are just not happening or the, the risks are higher? What more can we do to create those incentives in those environments? It's tough. It's not an easy one. It is uh, tough, but we need to solve it, right? Yes. So what is happening in Zambia now is that um, the fiscal framework has encouraged uh, the production and uh, the import, um, almost zero rated, of, of, of solar-related components and, non, and, and also renewable energy components to make them more accessible and more affordable. We've also seen with some of our private sector partners that actually a viable agriculture business creates an opportunity for an energy adaptation project. So the, the one I talked about, about cane growers is another. I know of a couple of others where actually relatively large companies for their energy needs, for poultry, have depended on charcoal. And they are on a transition plan to move away from relying on charcoal for their poultry towards more cleaner uh, energy, uh, energy options. And secondly, we've also seen that um, some pay-as-you-go options. I think there was an, a pay-as-you-go option that was also pre presented. We've seen that, first of all, somebody, there's a donor that has to pay upfront, or government has to pay upfront to set the basic infrastructure 
And then after that happens, then a financial model, a business model is developed that enables uh, either the smallholder farmers or fishermen to make a contribution towards the maintenance of, of that system. And I think uh, examples such as Vitalite in Zambia has, has been very key in terms of really expanding on rural e electrification. I think the other opportunity has been uh, the creation or the availability of guarantees uh, for um, renewable energy uh, projects. But again, the bankability of these is always very key. So linking them up to an actual viable business, we've seen that has opened up the opportunities for funding to flow uh, to, to, to these businesses, whether they're doing meat processing, whether they're doing um, you know, poultry, or whether they're doing um, they're into the fisheries value chain. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, and Minister, if I, I, I may um, come back to you on that same question. You know, what, what policymakers, governments, what more can be done to enable a de-risking of those private sector investments so that they can flow more to those less, um, less connected geographies to markets? What more can be done there? Thank you very much. Um, before I answer that question directly, I wanted to respond to my sister's um, suggestion when she talked about the conflict between the wildlife and the people, and you suggested making electric fences. There you will attract wildlife activists, because we try to do that in Uganda, and they are saying that we are infringing on the lives of the wildlife. So what we did was to uh, enact a law, a fully-fledged bill, which was enacted into an act where we are using other provisions like digging trenches, deep trenches, to separate between the co uh, communities neighboring to wildlife. But some of these animals are also becoming wiser, like the elephants. They pull together and then fill the ditch and cross. So this is something which this is something which we have to critically think about how human beings can stay together with the wildlife without infringing on one another's you know rights. Uh, the other question is that uh, I think government has to come in and do a more strong PPP. Where government has invested money, then it will mean it means that government will make sure that the risks are minimal. The risks are minimal. Government puts in money. Secondly, government regulates. You have to have clear regulations. And uh, that comforts uh, whoever you are partnering with. Clear regulations. And of course, the political will. Some of the important organizations in these important ministries have to be domesticated in areas where it will glaringly indicate total political will and commitment so that uh, there is that confidence uh, vested in. I think uh, that is how we can do it, and that's how Uganda is doing it in all these fights. Be it fighting HIV AIDS, you find the HIV uh, commission domesticated in the president's office so that the president can come out to fight. And normally when we have that big push, the conflict is minimized, the risks are minimized. Thank you, Minister. So regulatory environment, good governance, good coherent policies that are policies that are not only policies on paper, that po policies that are implemented. And then perhaps, Nico, to your uh, earlier point, systems approaches and, you know, us as actors on the ground breaking down some of those silos and looking at those systems which cut across government, private sector, and um, NGOs or civil, civil society groups. So thank you. Thank you, Minister. It's great, Marianne, that you're here because you're representing 
in Simusola, the business perspective, and I'm hoping you're going to be able to tell us about some of the business opportunities and, and the challenges. Over to you. Thank you very much, Simon. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yes, I will be happy to tell you about Simu Solar and our activities, and also as best I can to represent the challenges of the SMEs in the sector. Uh, it's truly an honor to be on this panel with the Honorable Minister from Uganda. We are uh, active in Tanzania and Uganda, and actually participating in the implementation of the program being rolled out in Uganda by the government to provide solar water pumping uh, to the farmers. So we, we really appreciate that work. So Simu Solar, as I've said, is uh, operating in Tanzania and Uganda. And our business is providing financed solar-powered water pumping solutions to farmers. So very much an adaptation strategy. Uh, the farmers in sub-Saharan Africa the, produce about 10% of the yield on their farms that farmers uh, do in uh, some of the more advanced farming communities. And also, only 5% of the farmers in East Africa use any kind of irrigation. So they're relying almost entirely on rain. And uh, I think it's pretty clear that with the changes in climate, we're seeing that rain is uh, much less predictable. And therefore, it's really a challenge for farmers to be able to uh, expect regular crop yields. So uh, in addition, the solar water pumping, even in the best of times, really does increase the yields and reliability. So some of the issues that make it a challenging business are that every farm is different, right? So you can't just have one product and you go out there and here's a solar water pump. We find that uh, we, we do go to the farms. We have to see what is the size of the farm, what are the crops that they're growing. Um, how, you know, how deep is the water, where is the water, what are the distances, and all of these things come into play when you try to figure out what is the system that is needed for that farm. So uh, in order to scale this business, uh, that's been our focus, as I think it is for all the SMEs, is to try to figure out how to really scale the business and reach as many people as possible. So we're after as much impact as we can get. So uh, for us, we've developed an app where our sales officers can go out with a smartphone, they enter in a small amount of data, and they're able to design what is the proper system for the farm. Which pump do they need? How many solar panels? What kind of pipe? The whole system design. And we offer 12 different solar water pumps. So we really have something that meets the needs of almost any smallholder farmer. We also do financing for those. So with the pay-as-you-go, as we've heard, uh, pay-as-you-go for productive use is really a nice solution. And the way we look at it is that we want to be able to see how the farm is producing and that if they add a solar water pump, which they will have to pay for over two years, uh, will they be earning more money right away, enough so that they can actually afford the solar water pump, right? So. Uh, if you're not earning more money with a productive use equipment, then it's very difficult to afford it. So that's the fundamental nature of being able to afford productive use equipment is that you're increasing your, your incomes with that. So um, I think that we've seen that the activities of many of the groups on this panel have been enormously supportive and uh, we've worked with SNB for, for many years now. And we really appreciate that kind of support. It is a challenging environment to get funding for businesses. So the biggest challenge that SMEs face in this space is getting equity funding. And of course, we're lending to the farmers, right, to purchase the equipment. So we also need to be able to borrow money so that we can lend it on. And it's a, it's a pioneering business. It's a new market. It's, it's, it takes a while to convince farmers. They really need to see the technology in action so they have confidence that it works, so they, they believe in the credibility and the returns. So it's a market that develops slowly. And uh, companies in the space really need to have longer term capital. And that's something that's quite difficult to find. There just aren't too many funders that are funding businesses in a way that really supports the needs of companies in this sector. So uh, I think I'll leave it at that, and we'll come back with some questions later. Th th thank you so much, Marianne, and I'll come back to you in a second. No. Honorable Minister, Dr. Ruth, you need to leave us now. I believe there's a certain president from the United States 
coming around here any minute now. So thank you very, very much for joining us, and thank you for all you do. And we will, ladies and gentlemen, we will continue our pan pan panel discussion. So, Marianne, if I can come back to you and others, I mean, what I hear there still is there's, you know what you're doing, there's a viable business model, there's big needs, right? There's this, this extraordinary statistic going around COP27 at the moment that the average sub-Saharan African person consumes the equivalent of one fridge worth uh, energy of the US, yeah? So there's a, there's a whole market here, right? There's a market, there's evidence of what works, there's a plethora of partners that want to take these things to scale. I'm perplexed. What's the barrier to scaling? Funding. Right? There's money. Well, it's not getting to the SMEs. So that's the challenge. There's money, there's big money. People are talking about billions of dollars going into adaptation, but I can tell you right now, it's not getting to the SMEs who are on the ground implementing these programs, giving people the tools they need for resiliency and ad adaptation. That money is very, very difficult to accessed by SMEs. So that, that's really the fundamental challenge. And I understand that from the perspective of organizations that are trying to deploy you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, it's really difficult to give money to organizations that are looking for you know, five million here and there and figuring it out and the due diligence and all of that goes into deploying that funding. But somehow uh, we have to figure that out because mm. uh, it is organizations like Siemens Solar, like the other organizations we've heard about already in this presentation. There are quite a few companies out there on the ground really trying to affect these kinds of changes. And uh, many are just going under because they don't have the funding to support the business on a long enough term to really get to profitability. Mm -hmm. So, Nashalara, I'm going to come back to you if that's okay on that one. WWF, SMV, we've worked extensively with SMEs, you know, r right around the world. Yeah, what are we, what are we getting wrong? Are we, is it we're not telling the story right? Are we not presenting the credible business cases? What do we need to do to get that funding through? more quickly, at greater scale, perhaps aggregator models, so smaller ticket sizes to those SMEs, but still overall large volumes of financing to the SME sector. What do we need to do? Good. Well, first of all, um, the last two, three years uh, of our partnership between WWF and the SMB, we've learned a lot in terms of what works and what needs to change. I think what we have learned is that um, we need to um, basically promote more aggregator models, as you have said, because it makes it easier for certain class of financiers to come on board and actually finance. We've also learned that we may have to do a bit more of the work ourselves in terms of building the capacity to make these SMEs become more investment ready so we almost have to work in um, sort of in a, in a graded uh, scale uh, that will prepare these companies for a year or two before they can meet the requirements of the investors. But most importantly, I think through our experience and the feedback we've given from the field to the investors, they are also learning and they're also changing and they're open to considering the different financing instruments um, but I think we just need to keep our eyes open. We have to keep, our, keep learning and also look for other partners. What we've also learned as WWF is that there's so many players out there struggling with the same issues, um, finding some solutions. And I think if we team up more, uh, we'll be able to facilitate the flow of funds uh, to where they, they are needed, that is to the smaller businesses. Yeah. Thank you, Nashilala. So what I hear there, and Marianne, and perhaps a bit of a plea or a plug, Nico, if I may, to, to you and groups such as the IKEA Foundation that are so active in this, in this space already is um, 
there needs to be greater resourcing towards that technical assistance to those SMEs, you know, th particularly if they're very nascent or emerging on their journeys, that technical assistance, that capacity building, that um, support is that as they're on their journey to absorbing larger volumes of financing, I think that's, that's hugely important. And then, of course, the, the origination itself, the finding the Simu Solars and the thousands of other companies that are out there, maybe, maybe smaller, maybe in more fragile places, the origination side, there needs to be more resourcing into that. And then, of course, the focus on the nexus, yeah? Those companies, those SMEs that are at the heart of nexus areas and how can they be brought forward through the right tranches of financing. Um, Nico, do you want to come back on any of that? Yeah, sure, thanks. And, and, and thanks, uh, uh, Nashlala and, and, and Mariana, for these great contributions as well. And uh, of course, as philanthropy, there's only so much we can do. Uh, um, we see a lot of our money also, money that we can leverage, money that we can use also for de-risking. Uh, because a lot of these innovations need to go, need to grind through to get the details right, uh, uh, to get the initial innovation cost covered. And that's what we, that's where we sometimes and often pick the bill up. But also work with a number of our partners to, to, to try to create the finance world, to try to change the finance world. Uh, two years ago, we, we uh, decided with a number of funders to support an organization called Aseli Africa, uh, which operates from Nairobi, which is really trying to work also with domestic banks to raise their understanding and their appetite for the agriculture and the renewable energy sectors. Because if they only see their money, making money in, for instance, real estate and concrete, yeah, then we're never going to get the systems right. Um, so, so that is, that's so then, and, and, and in combining also, indeed, as you say, TA and finance, uh, um, uh, we're working with a number of funds like Acumen or, or partners like Root Capital, who are going out to the underserved areas and really try to offer that combination of capacity building and long-term support mm -hmm. to SMEs to help them through the, yeah, the growing steps that every SME has to go through. Absolutely. I wish we could do a lot more, but you know, that's... But the great thing <laughs> philanthropic funding can do is one, it can move at speed, right? And two, it can absorb higher degrees of risk than other types of financing. And we certainly welcome that and see that with the IKEA Foundation. So Eva, I'm gonna to turn to you from the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Partnership, REIT, to give us your perspective on the agri-food energy nexus. Thank, thank you, Simon. First of all, I'd like to help thank our colleagues from uh, SNV and WWF for organizing this event. And thank you all for coming and sticking out uh, the one hour and a half. We know there's a big competition for your time here, so thank you for that. It's not easy to go last in a panel, but I really welcome the opportunity to bring all the elements that have been raised uh, today together. Um, I'd like to perhaps start with uh, Marianne and the private sector perspective because uh, it is a classic example of the renewable energy technology solution that is bankable, that is available, and that is already working in the markets. And let's be honest, we are experiencing a triple shock uh, in the world. We've got the energy crisis, we've got the climate crisis, and we've got a financing crisis. And yet, uh, and these three crises, they contribute to the destabilization of the food systems. And yet the renewable energy technologies that are available today have got a fantastic opportunity and massive uh, chance to put us on a low carbon pathway to improve lives and livelihoods, as well as um, protect um, communities from these shocks, from these external shocks. Um, we at REAP, um, we focus on creating markets for clean energy. We focus on supporting small and medium enterprises and uh, which um, deliver clean energy technologies and services specifically in off-grid areas. 
We've been doing this for 20 years, and uh, like uh, our colleague uh, Nachilala, we could be sitting here and talking to you about what we've learned uh, over the last 20 years, the good, bad, and the ugly. And we could sit here for a very long time. But I would like to use my time to tell you a little bit about an approach that is uh, shifting the markets for clean energy and the food systems uh, in the markets that we are operating in. Um, the first thing that I would like to pick up on is the systemic, systemic changes and the systemic approaches that need to be happening. Without those, we will not succeed. And this is exactly how we are approaching when we are entering a specific market. First and foremost, it requires a long-term engagement in a sector or in a market. This, we really need to ex equip ourselves with a lot of patience and a lot of flexibility. As Mariana said, we cannot expect our small and medium enterprises to be quick solutions and to be scaling up um, at a high speed. This requires a lot of patient capital and a lot of patience from all of the partnerships that we have on the ground. And then we deploy uh, four elements. Number one, direct support to the small and medium enterprises, not just through financing, but also through technical assistance and capacity building. Nachilala, you were mentioning this, or Nico, I think, around uh, mentoring and uh, building up the businesses, looking at the gaps in their business plans, fixing those gaps in the business plans, and bringing them to bankability, and assisting them with financing facilitation. This is really needed, but the good news is there are lots of uh, project preparation facilities that do provide these services to the small and medium enterprises at a very low cost or no cost to the small and medium enterprises, and these services can be drawn upon. So if you are a, a project developer sitting here with us, please do approach any of us. We can tell you how to access these um, services to develop your business. Secondly, it's market learning. You know, we are all here coming from the perspective of creating some public good. And what we are doing is uh, looking at data collection and through uh, managing that data, we are learning on what the SMEs need, where they struggle, where they succeed, uh, what, are, what is their customer base doing. And through that data collection, we are able to not only quantify the impacts that the small and medium enterprises are delivering, but also gather the evidence that we can then use in discussions with international financiers as well as local public um, policymakers. Number three, it's uh, working with local stakeholders. So the work that, you know, the data that we collect and the uh, knowledge that we have around supporting small and medium enterprises is really useful to public policymakers in understanding the characteristics of the businesses, in understanding their gaps, in understanding the risks, and then bringing about the change in the uh, policy and regulatory frameworks that enable then further growth of these um, small and medium enterprises. Um, and last but not least, it's structuring appropriate financing instruments in country. We've got to work with local financial institutions, creating well-functioning domestic uh, financial systems. If we constantly rely and continuously rely on international finance to assist uh, companies like Simul Solar or Socofresh, we will not achieve the wide sector growth that we are required to and we all need. So um, again, we've got a couple of tools and a couple of instruments on, in our uh, toolbox to assist the local financial institutions to de-risk their portfolios and to build their capacity in understanding how to lower their risk appetite and um, how to work with small and medium enterprises in the clean energy sector and in the um, food nexus. Um, I want to leave it at that. Um, other than uh, to say one more time that the solutions are available, the financing is available, and what we are required to do as a community here is to make sure that the appropriate financing is flowing to the people on the ground, to the small and medium enterprises, so that they can ex succeed and um, recover from this um, crisis that we're experiencing. Thank you. Thank you, Eva.
What's your wish list? What's the kind of two, if two things could happen? Yeah. All right. I'll tell you what's uh, keeping up uh, at, me, uh, at night awake. Right? Yeah. And this is, um, you know, the good news is the availability of climate finance. You know, many traditional investors are divesting from fossil fuels. Many um, governments are making more and more financing available. The private sector is coming to the table. We've got more money available than ever before. And yet they are locked and increasingly so in big funds. And distributing these funds down to the SME sector is a real challenge. So my appeal to all of you who are coming here from the financing um, industry is to choose your funds carefully choose the funds that are able to go and distribute the funding all the way to the ground. And we are not talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. We're not talking in tens of millions of dollars. We're talking in hundreds of thousands of dollars that are required to get these SMEs off the ground and to create the change. So that's um, issue number one. And issue number two is the local financial system. Um, they, the local financial institutions require a lot of assistance and there is space to be building the capacity to, under, to increase their knowledge about pro, risk profiles of renewable energy companies, to for, understand for them uh, the patient capital they need to provide and there is a huge room uh, to be bringing these financial institutions across the table and start investing into clean energy and agricultural sectors. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I have to say to in, in, endorse that point on lo local financing systems, and I think in particular as well, so many countries locked into mechanisms where the earning of Forex is so important Absolutely. that they get steered or driven towards those sorts of initiatives rather than import substitution uh, mechanisms or other ways to stimulate those local financing structures and systems. Marianne, wish list, two things? Just two. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I want to say that while uh, you know, equity is the biggest challenge, there are lots of other challenges. And the way, you know, the way SMEs generally succeed is they get some equity, then they maybe get some, you know, so they get some private funding, some public funding some grant money, and, uh, and Seamus Solar has benefited from the funding directly from SNV and also indirectly from uh, the IKEA Foundation, that the, the grant money does really help to move things along and sort of extend the timeline that, uh, that's available on, in terms of getting private funding. So, um, and also I would just say in the, in the enabling environment, it's more than just uh, funding, there's also awareness building. So, you know, surveys have been done in Tanzania and like none of the farmers had ever heard of solar water pumps. So, and it's very difficult for an SME in a country like Tanzania to try to raise the awareness of everybody in the country, you know, all of that training. So, and also the policies around taxes, you know, we pay 45% in import and VAT uh, on equipment that's coming in, whereas you would think that solar water pumps would be something that the country would want to have a policy to encourage and to try to keep the cost down for farmers. So, you know, it's policy, it's education, it's awareness. Thank you. So po policy, regulatory framework, and the, the taxation issues as well. Na Nashilala, you know, to really accelerate and scale implementation. I'm optimistic. I'm great, optimistic great. that we're on the way there. Um, I think for me, the central message is to, to the investors and the finance community is that we must speed up uh, the arrival of credit to the SMEs. Our, our, our earth, um, our future is all collectively under threat. And the SME is the vehicle that is going to deliver a sustainable our economy. So we need to look for solutions. Secondly, I think for us as SNV and, and WWF, we've already started in terms of working together to create an ecosystem for success for the SME. And I think we need to go out there in the market and find other players that are offering other solutions that are part of the ecosystem for success. What am I talking about? It's things like, you know, logistics solutions, payment solutions, storage solutions, market solutions, data solutions, all these things 
need to work together for us to be able to create this, this generation of SMEs at scale that, that are making a difference. Lastly, but not the least, for us to get there, public money, private money, philanthropic money has to, beyond this COP, work more closely together in terms of developing the financial instruments that are relevant to the target community that we're looking at. Thank you very much. A money nexus as well then. And definitely the nexus. On the nexus point, really, for us, our experience is that it's difficult to raise money for sustainable energy projects unless they're connected to mainly agriculture or another productive activity. So the nexus point is critically important. It has to start at the macro level. The policies have to be right. We need to make sure that also at, at institutional level, including our financial institutions, they're also thinking nexus uh, because they're not thinking about the state of of the water basin where the customers you know, depend for water and, and energy, then they also are threatening their own financial uh, sustainability. So nexus, 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 crucial. Thanks. Absolutely, thank you. And, and, and Nico, would you agree that blending or aligning of financing, be it philanthropic or governmental or private, is that from an IKEA Foundation perspective, is that part of your wish list as well? Oh, definitely, definitely, Simon. And, and uh, my wish list in that sense, you know, is, is more and deeper collaboration. And, and also, especially also collaboration in the end with, with, with the users who need this. Uh, we're all here together in a, in, in a great COP, but in the end, where are the SMEs? Where are the farmers? They're not, unfortunately, they're not part of these fora. They cannot express their needs. That, that need to be expressed so indeed the finance world and the policy world do really understand what is necessary. And I think my second wish list is, to, is that we have much more learning and sharing. We, talk, we, we love to talk about our success stories, but maybe also we need to learn much better to talk about what didn't go so well and what didn't go as planned so that we co don't keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again, but can indeed make these big jumps forward because we are getting off our own pride and, and, and share with each other what we really learn. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. So we've got some microphones ready to, to rove in the audience and we've got time for one or two questions. Um, who, who has a question for our panelists? This gentleman in the middle here. If you could introduce yourself, please. Thank you. My name is James. I work with WDRF at the Africa Energy Hub. You talked about the ecosystem. I'm interested in understanding whether you uh, you've worked with uh, financing partners like local microfinance institutions to help you know to support farmers and SMEs in actually being able to access these products. Any 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 linkages with uh, banks or, fi or local financial institutions or circles to help leverage the connection and the financing that can be you know accessed by local farmers to be to be able to purchase these products. Thank you. So ecosystems, um, working with other private banks, other funding mechanisms. Nashilala, do you want to take that one first? Yes, indeed. So uh, in the case of Zambia, we're working very closely with other players who are trying to do what we do as WF and SNB in terms of sharing pipeline. And what sharing pipeline does is that you know who else is, is, is in need of financing or capital, and they could actually benefit from the facility that we, we have. We've, in Zambia, we've also built very strong relationships with uh, local banks, and we are still on that journey of m working with them so that they can work towards tailoring some of their products uh, to, to be more appropriate uh, for, for SMEs. So I think that's what I can share. We're, all, we're still on that journey, yeah. Sure, and James, I can tell you, whilst I'm a simple moderator here, if I may, with SNV, we're working on the craft, craft program in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. It's enabling to support the SME sector to provide cli climate smart tools and technology to more peripheral smallholder farmers in those three countries. And just this morning, we had an event with the Dutch government, who are one of the funders of that program at Rabobank, and in response to your question, what we're hearing from the likes of Rabobank is they are increasingly pushing out and working with the local banking ecosystem as well 
so yes, indeed, we are, we are a part of that. Did you want to come in? Yeah, I would just say that in Tanzania, we've really struggled with getting financial institutions to support the farmers. Even the microfinance institutions don't seem to want to lend to farmers because of the risk. Uh, we've got a number of partnerships we're working on. We're hoping to get some support because, you know, financing is not our business. But unfortunately, if no one else will do it, it's the only way to, to build this industry. Thank you. I believe there's another question from, from a lady in the, in, the, in the front over here. Welcome. Thanks very much. <clears throat> I'm Vanessa Fasen. I'm G from GIZ, German Development Corporation. Um, I thought of, yeah, I just have one question and a remark. Uh, first of all, I think it's really impressive how Uganda actually managed to become uh, independent of fertilizer given the dependence on Russia now. Now, on you know, many African countries are actually dependent on fertilizers. Um, again, I think it's important also to mention that um, fertilize, like mineral or synthetic fertilizers is also a big emitter of greenhouse gas emissions and um, like sustainable agricultural productions like organic or ecological fertilizer hasn't really been mentioned yet, so I find it's really important to bring it in. Um, and one question, um, solar-powered pumps, I think, is great um, for cooling, for, for irrigation, for everything. However, in arid areas, um, it can be difficult also because we don't want also the groundwater resources to be depleting. So the question, I don't know who to whom uh, I should pose it, but um, how do you manage to actually, um, you know, uh, yeah, to, to kind of manage the solar power pumps, not to deplete the water resources. Thank you. E Eva, would you like to take that one or um, uh, Marianne first? So in Tanzania, there's ample groundwater. There's really no risk of depleting the groundwater with the water pumping that we're doing now. The refresh rate is, is much higher than needed. It's a bit more challenging in Uganda where there's some drier areas, but uh, there was an interesting study done recently that said that, you know, one of the problems with climate change is that you're getting shorter rains and you're getting all the rain at once and then you're not getting it spread out in a way that's good for agriculture. But that those shorter, heavier rains are filling the aquifers. So in a way it really helps and it keeps that water available if, and then the biggest challenge is the cost of the boreholes. And Eva? I, I just would like to bring in the role of data that uh, plays a role in uh, assessing the needs of the mar mar farmers or the agri-food um, companies across the value chain and uh, proper analysis around uh, resource availability and proper analysis around um, resource um, use uh, and um, ensuring sustainability is uh, a paramount part of every intervention. Um, and, you know, we live in 21st century and then the data-driven approach is something that uh, can be taken forward and the data is available. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, time for one more if it's a very brief one. Sir, at the back, behind in, uh, in white. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Musa Shuaibu. I'm... Uh, uh, a project uh, actor in one of the projects that is being supported by World Bank in Nigeria. And uh, I want to commend the members of the panel, particularly in talking about issues that are constraining implementation or performance of the small and medium uh, enterprises. Uh, it's very good, it's very insightful, and I believe it's going to be useful. However, what I want to ask is whatever said on the uh, preparatory documents. I have very good intention to have access to those documents because I believe it will help me in executing some of my projects that I intend to undertake, which are in line with the last speaker that uh, uh, promoting solar powered uh, pumps in terms of irrigation uh, as well as uh, utilization of groundwater. So I would very much like to uh, further engage with you ever. Thank you very much. Thanks for this. I'm, I'm really pleased that there is a project developer in the audience and that uh, we can be useful. As I said uh, as well, thanks. There are fantastic. several, it appears. Fantastic. Great. As I said, there is a number of specialized project preparation facilities represented on the panel. We provide very low cost or no cost uh, project support to developers to assist with 
business plan development, financial models uh, um, development, structuring of your financing, fixing various gaps within the business development and the growth um, pathways. So please do engage with us. We would be very happy to have the conversation. As long as your uh, project is in climate adaptation or clean energy, we're very well, certainly on our side, very happy to, to engage. Thanks. Fantastic, thank you. And with that, I would like to welcome Julia. Julia Wolf, Agricultural Economist at FAO, to bring it all together and provide some closing remarks. Welcome, Julia. Thank you so much, and um, I'm really pleased to be invited to, to this meeting. Apologies for my voice, but um, I'm a little affected by the high energy put into air condition at this COP, I have to say. So, yeah, it feels like Christmas. There's a long wish list of things, and I've been trying to hear carefully to, um, not to conclude, but to make some remarks. Um, FAO is um, an organization who's responsible for a broad area, as you know, food and agriculture, which includes, of course, the question of energy. And we're really pleased that you put this event together because, um, uh, and also Mr. Moderator Simon, he mentioned it um, so nicely in the beginning. It's actually a very particular COP where the food system is finally on the table, we say, on the agenda. You can see that in many forms and shapes, there was a high, like a food security uh, roundtable attended by 35 um, head of states, which never happened in the history of the COPs. There was, there's um, on the 12th tomorrow, there's um, Agriculture Day, where you also have a high political attendance of many ministers speaking at events that different um, initiatives launched, for example, the FAST initiative which is an um, agriculture transformation initiative that the COP27 presidency is launching. And um, this is just to say we have to look at it in, in a kind of a little bit more radical way. One of the points I heard here is that we have a problem of scale. And of course, a problem in the detail of designing projects, programs, policies in the right way. It's location specific in some way. And because we talk about adaptation, um, I think we have a problem of fragmentation, and I can also say that even within FAO, you would, I would say we have a problem of fragmentation where if you look at adaptation pro resilience projects, in many cases, they don't necessarily have an energy component. I think that's something that may need to change. No? So it's a question of, of how can, what can be done to mainstream energy as a core item of adaptation, because and, and in that way, um, the, the agriculture negotiations that are currently happening, and most of the agri agriculture negotiators are really busy on working on the text to guarantee, hopefully, still a substantive COP27 agriculture decision. We need to be aware that uh, energy is a social question. It's an, as, uh, as an agenda 2030 problem. And I think that needs to change, because we see it in many ways as part of like a productivity problem. It's an input, input productivity problem and not so much necessarily a social economic problem. Um, I was very impressed by the, by the data the minister gave in terms of the access of energy being so low. And some of us who have the privilege of traveling, we are always surprised, right? So the question to us in the room is what can be done here at COP27 to give more political emphasis to it. Because it's not just, and with all respect to the pro project formulators, it needs to be in the minds and hearts, let's say, of governments who think about regulations, about governance, coherence, food systems, circular economy um, aspects. No? I like the, the comment we had from the lady in terms of looking at fertilizer, because this is also an entry point, and I'm not, I'm not sure if the energy community looks into that as well in terms of energy that goes into manual fertilizer goes into you know, actually reducing the potential to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. So well done mentioning that point. Um, it also points to innovation. For example, the potential of seaweed becoming mineral, uh, like an organic fertilizer with a much lesser issue footprint. So there's many things, and, and we don't even have time enough to talk about all these new biosolutions. 
and the possibility to, to have a better access um, of people to, to, to energy. Because even that in the beginning, that was very nicely phrased. Um, it is about making energy affordable, um, it, to make it um, sustainable, and, and make it also reliable. No? So we have both. We have the short term, which we have discussed, but also the longer term, which relates to so many nexus issues in terms of finance, planning, governance, tenure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let me just share um, some of the points um, where FEOC is a priority. And we just issued a new um, strategic framework which lasts from 2022 to 2031, so 10 years. We have a 10 years plan. Energy is definitely a key part of that. And we also revised our uh, um, FEO strategy on climate change where we bring climate, uh, climate and energy to a centerpiece, let's say. So one of some of the priorities um, I like to, to mention here is um, to prioritize low risk and high impact action you know, when it comes to, and that includes a lot of things we heard like small solar pumps, farmers, dealing with drought periods, um, et cetera, et cetera. The importance of access, uh, improved access to finance. So now we, we heard about the finance, finance nexus. But who is actually looking at the percentage of climate finance going to agriculture, going to energy? So energy in agriculture. No? So I don't have a number for that. It will be extremely important because we did a recent study with OECD data and we, we noted that despite climate finance go up, the, the um, amount that of, agriculture, of climate finance going into agriculture decreased 20%. You know? So if you take a subset question on the energy, you will probably see if we have an increasing or decreasing trend. So I don't know if somebody has this number available. Water, which was also carefully mentioned, but just by one of the panelists I've paid attention well. Um, it's extremely important. Also, one, water goes along with energy being like an undervalued stakeholder in the whole discussion. I always imagine I have like this a round table and it's like, where's, where's Mr. Water or Mrs. Water? And M Mr. Energy didn't come today. So that's how I, I look at it. But it's really key because unless everybody sits on the table, as you all know, the negotiation cannot happen and the future cannot be planned properly you know, because we, we overlook very important matters. Um, third point is the enabling environment and we've talked about it already a couple of times it is really key and um, my, my former life was uh, to do a lot um, kind of project uh, design and what you the, the pleasure you have looking in the project design is actually how many countries struggle with government govern as in the lack of incentives and existing rules that had a reason 20 years ago but need revisions so finance needs to also go into these things. No, it's really government governance reforms and, and seeing what could be the incentives of, of new energy, innovative energies coming into it. Now, it may be simple things like there's actually a high import tax on solar water pumps because it's not yet listed. No, I mean, I'm sure you have much in more interesting examples, but it is really key because, I mean, you can... You can have an amazing dialogue with millions of farmers and they're all excited about the water pumps. If you then not can, cannot import water pumps, solar water pumps, that's the end of the story. You know? So we have to give credit to that. Um, and last not least, and you talked a lot about that, is the importance of um, access to data inf inf and information. Because a lot of the, the innovative solutions we have need actually a lot of more capacity and that's like hard and software capacity you know it's often the lack of the computers or the trained people the extension workers to help really predict and choose the right technology for a medium to long term planning for for kind of a, a system change in in the production system or the, the the very local practice we we talk about so i think with that i would i would leave my comments here thank you um, I wish us all a good COP, and, and again, I really hope that it will be um, a forward-looking COP that, with a substantive agriculture decision, which includes energy. Thank you so much, Julia. So excellent, important points, many, many points to take away there. 
I will conclude by just drawing on two of them, if I may, which I heard those words, fragmentation and lacking in scale. So can we not find a way to defragment as partners as that critical pathway to scale? Defragmentation for scale. With that, panelists, thank you for an excellent, robust conversation. Thank you for joining us. Hello, testing. Hello, hello. Hello, testing. Hello, hello.